Dayline did a special episode recently called Echoes in the Canyons and featured the Suzanne Morphew case. And there were a few guests on the show. Suzanne's sister Melinda, Suzanne's brother Andy, Barry's sister Marcy, and Suzanne and Barry's friend Troy. Two lawyers also made an appearance who are not part of the case, a prosecutor named George and a defense attorney named Scott. And of course, Keith Morrison, who told the story and was interviewing the guests. And Keith opens up talking about how Suzanne went for a bike ride that day and then she went missing. It flashed to Andy being in Salida and talking about when he first got to Salida and looked around and saw all the mountains and he said, oh my God, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Now they flashed the body cam where we saw Barry arrive at the scene where the bike was found. Have a look. Where is it? Where's the bike? Oh, it's right there. Where was it? It was like just right down here in this little embankment right here. So. Sorry, Chippy, that's uh, We got the husband on the scene here with you. I'm here with my daughter. She's at Barry's house. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, you can go down there. Is it a crash? I mean, the bike looked, the way it was laying, it kind of looked like it, but there's not really that much damage to the bike. That's the thing. Lion? Yeah, it was just like lion. Was there no lion? Mountain no, lion? No, no, I, I didn't see anything that would I didn't see anything, and they're, they're not letting us go over the side. Because we're getting a track. They're bringing dogs. They're bringing dogs they're just, right right just right down in here, yeah. As Barry was driving home to Salida, Barry's sister Marcy said that he called her and she said, and he was very emotional and said, I don't know what's happening, I'm driving there now. She went on a bike ride, she didn't come back. The girls have been calling her, texting her, I've been calling her, texting her, she hasn't answered all day. They also showed a clip where Barry went inside the home with the authorities and they picked up some clothes of Suzanne's to take with them for the investigation. And sir, will we go inside? This just goes directly to where something that she's born today, and let's not touch anything just for a case. Okay. Is this unlocked? Yes. Which way would that be? This way? No. Down there. These are all hers right here? Yeah. yeah. Have you got a plastic bag? Yeah. Or a paper bag? It's a sports bag. It's pretty good. I mean, it's direct contact with the skin. No, we should just be fine with one. It was noted in the Dateline special that they couldn't find Suzanne's phone, but they did find her wallet and her ID, which was in the car. And Suzanne's sister, Melinda, talked about getting a phone call from their dad, Gene Mormon. He has since passed away. She said that when Gene called, he said, honey, your sister, Suzanne, is missing in Colorado. And Melinda says, I'm not a profane woman by any stretch of the imagination, but I said three cuss words following those remarks. I had a terrible feeling. And in the special, it said some one called Troy Skinner, who is from Indiana, and he is a friend of both Barry and Suzanne's for more than 30 years. He said, they thought maybe a mountain lion is involved, and that was all I really heard at the time. It was very disturbing, very disturbing. And when Suzanne's brother Andy heard the news, he hopped over to Salida, and he went to the scene where the bike was, and the mountain lion theory came from Barry's mouth. Andy says, I said, Barry, it's not, it's not a mountain lion. This is done by a human being. And he said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. That means someone did something to her as opposed to a mountain lion getting to her. Now, it's important to note that Barry changed the mountain lion theory a day after Andy wasn't buying it.
And a week after Suzanne went missing, Barry did the emotional plea on Facebook. And prior to that, he put up a $200,000 reward. Now in the Dateline special, it said that there was a suspicious vehicle near where the bike was found, but nothing came from that. Now in my last video, I talked about Shoshana Dark, who claimed that she made a phone call about suspicious vehicles in the area around the time that Suzanne was missing, but it did not state the date. And this was in Barry's arrest affidavit. Now it flashed back to Troy and talked about Suzanne being missing. And he said, I went upstairs on the bed and my wife walked in and she said, are you okay? And I just started crying. I just started crying. So then investigators started looking 1200 miles away where the story really began, Keith Morrison said. And Melinda talked about Barry in his younger years. She said, Barry was a Tom Cruise kind of a guy. I mean, he had it going, the beautiful car. You know, he had money. He was a very, very hard worker. He still is. A star athlete in the local high school and all the girls wanted Barry Morphew. Now, no, it was said that Barry would actually drive down the road with one hand on the wheel and the other one working out. Now, Barry was a baseball player and he was drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays. He also spent some time I know in Medicine Hat, which is just a couple hours away from where I live. But Barry became injured and he had to go back to Indiana and his baseball career was over. He actually wrote on one of his applications that his nickname was Bear, which is why I call him Bear Bear. Now, he got together with Suzanne, who was in high school at the time, and she was said to be very popular and the boys were smitten with her. In walks Jeff Libler, which I thought it was Liebler, but it's Libler, and and he was a talented golfer. And Keith asked Marcy, Barry's sister, was he a good guy too? And Marcy says, absolutely. The Liblers are a great family. Wonderful reputation. We admire them. I believe they admire us. Now, Marcy's demeanor actually reminds me a lot of Lori Daybell's sister, Summer. They seem to be very similar in mannerisms and how they speak and how they're shocked at these, this kind of news. And Suzanne and Barry met at a local golf club. And Marcy says they became close, they confided in each other, and they fell in love. Then Suzanne was diagnosed with cancer. And Melinda said Suzanne is and was the darling of our family. She said Barry stepped up at the time that Suzanne was diagnosed with cancer the first time. Melinda says, when my sister became very ill with chemotherapy, Barry was the hero of her family. When she got so weak she couldn't walk, he carried her. He carried her in his arms. When her hair started to fall out, he cut her hair for her. Suzanne recovered and in 1994, Barry and Suzanne got married. And she was said to have wanted a family very desperately. She hoped and prayed. As it was her understanding, she may not be able to have kids. And Melinda said, and now we have Mallory and Macy. And for my sister, that was a profound faith building experience for her to be able to conceive these beautiful girls after chemotherapy. Keith talked about them both being doting parents and that Suzanne was a stay at home mom while Barry had a job at landscaping. And Troy, their friend said he worked his butt off and learned the trade. And then after a couple of years, he started to make some real money and he used it to pay the house off. Melinda said, Barry Morphew was solid. He's a very self-disciplined man. He was extremely good at whatever he did. He's a marvelous hunter trapper. Keith said Barry loved the outdoors. They both loved their family and their faith. And I have a video below where you can read about Barry's first cousin and what his thoughts are, which he published an article last week. I believe it's about a week ago. Now, Marcy said, Barry and Suzanne have always had a very strong, wonderful relationship. God was the center of their lives and their marriage. And for that reason, it was a strong one. In 2018, two years before Suzanne vanished, Mallory wanted to go west to school in Colorado. And it was said that Suzanne had the idea to move. Troy said, Suzanne told me in her own words, she'd went to Barry and said, I need to be close to her. You've always wanted to move out west. Let's go, now's the time, let's go. And it's different than what we've heard in the past that Suzanne didn't want to leave. So this is different information. I can understand about wanting to be close to your child. I have a 19 year old and I would like to move out of the province. However, I can't stand the thought of being away from him, even though he's a grown adult. So they bought 
their $1.5 million house on seven acres. And before they left to Colorado, Suzanne gets news that the cancer's back. But she forged ahead and still moved to Colorado, even with the news. And she was successfully treated and began a whole new life. The Dateline special then talked about the spring and summer of 2020 being consumed by the search. Keith asked Marcy, what was Barry telling you about the search? Marcy says that they were going sun up to sun down. He said he and his friends. And Troy traveled in July to support Barry and his girls. Now, side note, in July of 2020 is when people were saying that Barry got together with Shoshana. And that was in the affidavit, although the authorities didn't confirm it. And Barry stated that he didn't meet face to face with Shoshana until October of 2020. So when Troy arrived in July, he said, Mallory Macy came up and hugged me, I bet for five minutes, and those girls just bawled their eyes out. When Barry and I would just get out and ride around and run errands and stuff, he was, he was okay. But when we were at the house, he was more quiet than I had ever seen him. And here's the really interesting tidbit in my opinion. Let me know your thoughts. Troy said, Barry wouldn't sleep in the bed. Barry slept in the couch outside the bedroom. I don't think he ever slept in the bed again. What do you think about that? Now, by the end of summer 2020, it was said that Andy was frustrated. He said, it's torturous, not knowing is horrible. We need closure. You can't go to bed. You can't wake up. You can't even take a nap without thinking about this. And it's just horrifying. Then the search happened in September and Andy did the search and Dateline went along. Also, they got help from the Sheriff's Department and CBI. Now, notable that they didn't talk about in the Dateline episode is the hits by cadaver dogs. But the weird thing is, was there were hits and yet they didn't dig to find out more. Now, in the episode, it said that they found shreds of clothing. I don't know if I've heard that before that they found shreds. Let me know if you've heard it. Troy stated that Barry was in a kind of constant anguish and he wanted to do whatever to help the police. Even though in the rest affidavit, Barry was contradicting himself throughout the investigation numerous times. Troy said, he told me that he had done approximately 30 hours of interviews with law enforcement. It was my understanding from the girls that law enforcement was coming by on a regular basis and would actually hang out with him a little bit. And Keith asked Marcy, you know, the spouse comes under immediate suspicion. Did that concern you at all? And Marcy said, it did not concern me. We were aware of it because the investigators told him, listen, the husband is always the first suspect. We have to watch you closely. We have to check everything out. We don't believe you you did it, but we have to check everything out. Troy thought they had an ideal marriage and there was no problems. He said, I never saw any, I never saw him with problems. And Keith asked, did you get a sense at all that here was a man who was trying to cope with something he had done? And Troy said, no, I got a sense of a man that was trying to cope with the reality his wife was missing. And then they talked about the true crime community. And Troy said, I never knew the true crime community was out there like it is, how there are groups of people that follow these cases. Barry was getting hate mail. I was there with him at a park one day and some kids riding his bike stops and lifts off to him. They talked a little tiny bit about Tyson Draper's video. They just showed a little clip of when Tyson first met Barry where the bike was found and talked about posting this to YouTube. And I think this was a huge video. This was something that really showed Barry and his thought process and his reasonings and the triangle. Now, Troy says it's very disheartening to see so many people make conclusions based on so much wrong information. It spreads like wildfire. People would post things to Facebook and social media. He was at Walmart today, or they take a picture of him eating breakfast or eating dinner somewhere. The guy couldn't go anywhere without being hounded. And they talked a smidge also about Barry showing love letters to Lauren Scharf, who's the reporter and has been covering this since the beginning. And she said, you know, put it on record right now. If you did this, you know, what would you say to people? And he said, absolutely not. I love my wife. Now, Keith brings up that six months later, Suzanne's still not found. There's no word of what's happening. And he says to Marcy, how are their daughters taking it? And Marcy says, how can you take it? You just have to get up every morning and survive. I don't know how they did, except through God's strength. But they got up every morning and lived. 
That's all about all they could say for a little while. Troy talked about the girls and he said they knew rumors were out there. They were getting hate mail and stuff in their social media accounts, but it was made very clear that they didn't know the rumors and they didn't want to hear them. The girls and Suzanne, I mean, they were her whole life. She loved those girls and they loved her, so I can't imagine the pain they've gone through. Now, I'm wondering what kind of conversation that Barry had with his girls. I know he told them about the affair fair, but I'm wondering what else went with that. Now, when the search happened, Barry never showed up to help and he didn't go to the prayer vigil. And Andy said, we ran into him on the mountain. I don't know why I'm standing here and he's not. I don't know why there's a prayer vigil for my sister and Barry's not standing here getting the support from all the wonderful people that want to know what happened to her. I can't understand it. It just tells me something. Now, Barry said that by Andy doing the search, it was a publicity stunt. And think about this, they have been brother-in-laws for the last 30 years. Imagine the confusion for Andy and Suzanne's family. Where's the support for each other and for Suzanne, right? Now, Barry was said to be carrying a gun over his shoulder outside of his house while the search was on. What's he protecting? And why wasn't he searching? Keith asks Melinda, what have the investigators learned from you that's helped in the investigation? Melinda says, I've spoken to them a great deal about the dynamics of Suzanne and Barry's relationship. I call it the imbalance of power and that imbalance of power was there for many years. I think that she entrusted herself in a very unique way to Barry because of that cancer journey. And Keith says Barry had exemplary behavior way back. Barry was in control of the decision making, the money and pretty much everything. And Melinda says, and Suzanne wanted to take back the power of her own life because she'd given it away. I spoke with them a lot of that because for me, that is very key in this whole case. Barry Morphy was an avid hunter. He had beautiful trophies in his home. My sister was a trophy for Barry Morphy. And my sister didn't want to be a trophy anymore. She wanted a life. She wanted more than just be a trophy. And she wanted down off that wall. Now, Barry had made comments about women and men needing sex. That's all they want is sex. That was in the affidavit, and I read that in my last video. Now, Melinda had wondered if that the move to Colorado was to save their marriage, and Suzanne thought that Barry was cheating on her. Melinda said, I said to her, you know, Suzanne, that's a big move. She alluded to me that there were problems in the marriage, there were infidelity problems in the marriage, and as her older sister with some experience, I said to her, you know, Suzanne, if a man is unfaithful in Indiana, he will be unfaithful in Colorado. You will only take this problem with you. Keith asks, how did she take that? And Melinda said, she listened. Keith asks Troy, any hint that one of them been straying? And Troy says, there was never a hint and I never witnessed it in a way they behaved toward each other. I know that's the rumor and the insinuation from some people, but it's not anything I ever witnessed myself, not anything any of my friends witnessed with him. Then in May of 2021, on May 5th, Barry Morphew was arrested for the murder of Suzanne Morphew. And there was an announcement from Sheriff John Speezy. Barry was charged with first degree murder among with some other charges and he pled not guilty. He says to Melinda, you're not at all surprised that he was charged with first degree murder. Melinda says, no, I struggled deeply to believe this. I did not want to believe this, but I live in reality. Keith says to Marcy, there's not kind of an expectation that this is gonna happen. And Marcy says, no. No, devastated. I mean, as if we weren't devastated enough that we can't find Suzanne, no, we did not expect it at all. It was a shock to us. Now back to the body cam, it shows that there's been some issues with Barry and Suzanne's relationship. Macy's boyfriend was shown on body cam and the officer asks him, do Barry and Suzanne get along pretty well? Do Barry and Suzanne get along pretty well? Uh. You can answer honestly. You know, I think I think they've had some problems. Okay. Yeah, in the past. Like, just normal. Normal husband and wife type deals. Oh, they like talk about separating or anything. They like have, that? yeah. Okay. I would, yeah. And you know this through through Macy. Yeah, I'm Macy. very close with uh, her. Yeah, with her it's daughter. important that you, at this I know, point I know, you I tell know, them I know, anything that yeah. you know. And there were texts about Suzanne wanting to walk away from Barry. She also said to her best friend, I wouldn't feel safe alone with him in a text. And the May 6th text that we heard about, I'm done, let's just handle this civilly. And she also said to Melinda that there's verbal abuse as well as physical abuse. 
Now note, the court just recently decided that verbal statements of abuse would not be admissible, but the texts are going to be, from my understanding. And there was also talk from one of the daughters about Suzanne wanting a restraining order. Melinda said, I could tell she was getting ready to take some action that she was no longer willing to compromise her life to be in a relationship with Barry. Barry insisted that he never abused Suzanne emotionally or physically. In fact, he talked about clipping Suzanne in the nose once, but that was an accident. And now is where in the Dateline special that the prosecutor and the defense attorney start talking. And the ex-Colorado prosecutor's name is George Brockler. He says, to get to the point where you can allege a husband has murdered his wife, you've got to have a pretty compelling motive and it's not going to be, hey honey, dinner's burnt. Investigators say that Barry couldn't keep Suzanne from leaving him. And they figure he resorted to something that he'd done his entire life. He hunted Suzanne like he hunted animals. And they talked about circumstantial bits and pieces. And they showed the pings around the house. That was his chipmunk excuse about chasing a bunch of chipmunks. And he had, you know, killed 85 chipmunks with a 22. But this time was a tranquilizer gun. Why would you want to trank a chipmunk? Where, what's he gonna do with it? Take him somewhere? Like, what did he do with the chipmunk? They talked about the damage to the bedroom door as well. The guest prosecutor said, you seize on a fact like that and say, obviously she barricaded herself in the bedroom to protect herself from Barry. Investigators did go back to the previous owners to see if there was damage before on that house and it was said there wasn't. They also found an unspent bullet case in the bedroom and they talked a teensy bit about the tranquilizer gun at the house and the dart cap in the clothes dryer, but that was just about it. There was, there was nothing really else mentioned. Now, the defense attorney who's the guest, his name's Scott Robinson, he also followed the case and said, one of the many pieces of evidence that casts enormous suspicion on Barry Morphew is the probable use by him of a tranquilizer gun at some point of some purpose. And Keith said that there was implication from prosecutors that Barry shot Suzanne with a gun he used to sedate a deer and there was no bike ride. And between 3 and 4 a.m., electronic sensors show Barry's truck opening and closing multiple times and that he then drove to a job site 150 miles away, which we know was Broomfield, and his cell phone stopped five times at five different dumpsters. Now, George, the prosecutor, says, to stop once to dump trash, I'd say okay. Twice, mm, maybe the other dumpster was full or inaccessible. Five times, that's ridiculous. Now, when he got to Broomfield and he checked into the hotel, the coworkers met him there and said it reeked of chlorine. George says, in a lot of these no-body cases, you'll still have, well, in the bathroom we found our DNA and copious amounts of it, and in and around the tub, or we found a big blood pool in the carpet with the victim's DNA. This one lacks all of this stuff. And so the prosecutions tried to make up for it by saying the reason there's no forensic evidence is dude covered it up in the hotel. And George says, and it's the accumulation of patterns that mattered. George says, it's the cumulative effect of each of these things and the context of what happened that makes them seem incredibly suspicious. Note, Andy actually said in one of his interviews that the detectives told him that it also smelled in his house of the same thing or similar thing like bleach. And Andy also said that there's no coolers that were found in the house, which is odd when Barry is a hunter. And Keith says to Troy, I can't imagine that man can be guilty of such a crime. And Troy says, nope, not this guy because I've never saw him capable of it. Their relationship was the type of relationship anybody would want, which makes me think he would never be capable of doing something like this. Keith says, unless they had some dark, deep secret we don't know about. And Troy says, that's why they call them secrets. Then they talked a bit about the spy pen. And we know that Suzanne got the spy pen from her friend and she wanted to record Barry because she suspected him of cheating on her and what they found was that Suzanne was cheating on Barry and George said the idea that she gets discovered using the same method she was trying to discover her husband and an affair with it's just incredibly ironic. Now, Suzanne was having an affair with Jeff Libler who has six children and he's married. I do not know at this point if he's still married, but at the time he was. George said, I was shocked, I was surprised, I did not see that coming given everything else surrounding this case. 
And Keith asks Marcy, never a hint of this long-term affair, and Marcy says, never, never. And Scott, who is a defense attorney, says, if Barry Morphew knew that his wife was carrying on with another man and he had been doing so for two years, that would certainly create a significant motive on his part. And George said, I've been having an affair with another guy for a couple of years and we've been doing it all over the country and you had no idea. Imagine what that would do to someone's emotions, their passion. Now, I do wonder if Suzanne spent years wondering about Barry's infidelity and they make this move to Colorado. Maybe the words from Melinda to Suzanne really rang true about a man being unfaithful in one state is going to be in another. Doesn't matter what state he's in. And maybe she became suspicious in Salida. In my last video about Barry's dirty secrets, we heard quite a bit of interesting tidbits about Barry sliming on women and doing inappropriate searches for 14 year old teenagers and hand jobs. Yep, that's a known fact. So I wonder if Suzanne felt like, you know what? I don't care what he does anymore. I'm done, just like her text, and I'm just gonna let my eyes wander. Maybe she knew that she couldn't get away from Barry that easily, and this is the only way she knew to do it. I'm not excusing her affair, but I do wonder what her thought process was. Also notable in the affidavit, Barry didn't want the affair to come out. Well, yeah, if it did, there's the motive, right? Let me know your thoughts. Barry's defense team ripped into this theory and said Barry didn't know of any affair and that January of 2021 is when investigators talked to Barry about it, which was true. Marcy said if he didn't know about it until January 2021 and she went missing on May 10th, 2020, it's not a motive. He had no clue. None of us had any clue. But if you read the rest affidavit in Barry's words, a lot of things he does lie about. And you can't dismiss the oddities the week leading up to Suzanne's disappearance. Let me know below if you believe he did know or he didn't know about the affair. And back to the door jam. George says, all we know is it looks like the door jam was damaged in a way consistent with someone who tried to force the door open. Don't know when, don't know how, don't know why. As for the truck, Barry's defense team said the truck doors was just him loading up, you know, equipment for work at three in the morning. And they said that the five dump runs was, well, he's a landscaper, he's always dumping stuff. But George says that their explanation here is, look, this is a guy whose habit and practice is to dump stuff out of the truck. When he's done doing construction work, he's got to find them until he gets it all done. That's not weird, it's just what he does. And about the chlorine in the pool, the defense attorney Scott said, in the midst of a pandemic, a hotel room that smells like chlorine and has wet towels means close to nothing. But what they don't have is any evidence that a homicide actually occurred. Now remember I talked about Andy and the house smelling like that too. So again, there's more of those pieces put together. Then they talk about the DNA, which is the most frustrating part in the entire case, in my opinion. They said the DNA was found in the Range Rover and it was a partial match connected to an unnamed man connected to three sexual assaults in Arizona and Illinois, which doesn't mean that it's the person who did the sexual assaults, only that the person is related to that person. And Barry's defense team got ticked off and said to the prosecution, you're covering it up, you, did, you knew about this and you know, blah, blah, blah. And the prosecution denied that. They said, no, we didn't cover anything up. The defense attorney Scott said, the unexplained DNA in Suzanne Morphew's vehicle linked to unsolved sexual assaults in two other states gives the defense lawyers maybe the greatest tool in the defense lawyer's toolbox. It's an enormously powerful argument in a case where proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, even with the DNA considered, the judge ruled probable cause, but they granted Barry bail on a $500,000 bail and a non-working ankle monitor, but that was not mentioned in the show. And the daughters, Macy and Mallory, are sticking by their dad. Keith says to Melinda, Barry's daughters, Suzanne daughters, are very much with their father. They believe him, they're sticking with him, they have no doubt that he's an innocent man. I mean, what do you do with that? And Melinda says, yes, well, the girls love their dad and they've lost their mother. They have one parent, I understand that. Now, Barry's team recently filed for a motion to dismiss the case. For now, the trial is scheduled for the end of April. What are your thoughts on the case being dismissed? And what are your thoughts on the Dateline special? Here's what you can watch next, and you'll see a glimpse into the man Barry shows himself to be. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like, and don't forget to share this out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon.